Good evening, everyone. Um, tonight, we're presenting uh, Hotpot Lab number 16. And uh, the project that we're going to show today is Modalities. Uh, it's a project by Marie Balman, Till Bowerman, and uh, Miguel Negrama. Negrama, yes. <laughs> and uh, Modalities is a, is a software that is uh, developed in Super Collider or in Super Collider language, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. And it's about changing mappings in real time, which is quite interesting. In at time, we've been looking at different ways to uh, do mapping and to look at mapping, and also ways to change mapping during the, the course of a performance. So I'm really curious to what they have to say. So are we. <laughs> um, well, there's, there's some impressions from the last week that uh, Till has photographed between coding. Um, no, I will just do the fancy slides. I will enlighten it, lighten it up with some sounds. Um, um, so it's just uh, the three of us that are at the bottom uh, tonight. Uh, so what is modality? Um, it's a name for a kind of loose collaboration uh, between a couple of SuperCollider developers uh, and advanced users. Uh, and our goal is basically to create a toolkit uh, to make it easy to make instruments uh, out of any controllers uh, that you get your hands on. Um, and also provide some ways to do like slightly more complicated mapping, do some kind of data conditioning. Uh, and quite important is also being able to change mappings on the fly. Um, and that's a pity that Jeff is not here. Jeff has been working with uh, a couple of controllers in his live setup uh, where he has a joystick on one hand, uh, a keypad uh, on another hand, and okay, and a MIDI fader or launchpad thing in the middle. And occasionally he has the problem that he has some nice sound, which for which he needs both hands, but then he wants to move the slider, and he can either go down and do that with his nose or his mouth. But it's much nicer to be able to basically push a button to free up um, basically a button on one hand, take it with the other hand, and then being able to move one hand freely. So basically change the mapping of the instrument while you're playing. So uh, you basically get a hand free to do yet something else. Um, so that's, uh, I think, what we mean with modal control, that you can change control on the fly. Uh, the meetings we've had uh, as developers started uh, last year in October in Bergen, uh, where a couple of people, uh, Alberto de Campo, Walter Snui, and myself, we were invited to come over to Bergen uh, at BEC and basically spent a week to uh, present and discuss and uh, collaborate on this. And, uh, and we climbed the mountain there and other fun <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, took the boat across the fjord. Uh, and so we liked it so much that uh, we, came, we were looking uh, for other places to meet and Stein is an excellent place to, to hang out at and quite fitting for what we're doing. Um, so this time we were with uh, Jeff came over uh, again. He lives in the United States. Uh, Alberto came over from Berlin. I'm now residing in Amsterdam. Uh, Till came from Helsinki. He's originally from Germany. Uh, Miguel came all the way from The Hague. <laughs> <laughs> really originally from Portugal. Uh, Hannes Hulze came over from Cologne, who's actually from Italy. Uh, <laughs> Robert is actually Dutch and came from Amsterdam. Um, and so what we've done here is 
kind of similar things, presenting, sharing uh, experiences uh, and discussing. We've also did an exotic excursion to Eiberg, where I now live, to sort of get the water feeling. Um, so what we've done in the last week, uh, we started at the Superclider user meeting, which uh, is happening every month here at STEIN. Um, and so we started with uh, Jeff presenting his instrument there uh, and discussion with everyone who was there. Uh, then we had basically t three something days where we mm. people presented what the kind of stuff they had been working on, uh, and we talked a lot about that, uh, discussing different concepts, did a lot of brainstorming. Uh, then we did quite a bit of coding, more brainstorming. We played a concert in between uh, at the DMK event. Uh, then some of us left, and the three of us did some more coding, and Alberto did some more coding while in Berlin. Uh, and then we created some instruments for tonight. Um, this is a very simple one which basically took 10 minutes to make. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to entice you slowly. Um, so what is the idea? Uh, we want to be able to use different devices that work with different protocols. Um, there's MIDI devices, uh, there's some there. Uh, HID devices, um, OSC devices, serial devices, etc. Um, the Wii mode would be another one, Bluetooth. And kind of provide a common interface to use these devices. So if you want to use the device, you should not have to care about what it actually, what language it speaks, basically. Uh, and then we also wanted to provide a system to then process the data that comes from these devices uh, and also make kind of these real interfaces and virtual interfaces interchangeable. So if you say you went somewhere, you want to share your instruments which works with a, a nano control, but you forgot it, uh, you can create a GUI to simulate it. Or if you have something which works works nice with the button, but maybe the button should be a toggle. You should just be able to exchange that quite quickly. Um, so kind of provide a common interface to these things. Um, so that's what we did. Um, we wrote a couple of classes uh, that try to deal with uh, these different devices. Right now we have, uh, for MIDI and HID, we've got it working. Um, the others we will uh, get to after this residency. Uh, we've tried to provide the same interface to use these devices, so as a user you only use MKTL. Uh, then there's a system to process data from these devices called Dispatch. And a dispatch is basically a chain of functions which operates on a certain set of data. Uh, then we created templi templates for different devices. So uh, basically the toolkit comes with a whole bunch of devices that it knows. It knows what kind of controls they have uh, and provides ways to access those. I'll still be going through all times uh, controllers and <laughs> make mappings for, or create descriptions for those. Uh, and then also templates for several common ways of processing, like uh, a trigger, uh, some kind of scene-based control. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that uh, in a second. And basically between MKTL and Dispatch, the, the interface to use these classes, uh, to use outputs from that, is quite similar. So it's quite easy to just exchange one for the other. Uh, so this all seems so simple. <laughs> Why did you need a week or more for that? Um, well, actually, it's not so trivial. Uh, it's different protocols work in different ways. Uh, 
basically how to access it uh, from SuperCollider, uh, what kind of things the operating system reports to SuperCollider, uh, how the different controls come into the system. Uh, they're all just slightly different. Uh, they also are different between operating systems. Uh, we've been working with Linux and OS X. Um, so they provide the data in different ways sometimes, so you need to have a system that can deal with that. Uh, and then different controllers also have different semantics. Um, Till is going to say something about semantics. Yes. Um, semantics of controllers, yes. Uh, maybe I just take this one, which you have mm -hmm. here. And um, yeah, maybe maybe I should start with with this thing about interfaces because um, when you when you have a classical instrument like a guitar or a keyboard or a keyboard, yeah, a classical instrument like a keyboard, uh, like a yeah. piano for example <laughs> or something like this, you, the the thing on which you play is actually the thing that also makes the sound. Uh, whereas we here work with something where you have the abstraction between the actual interface with which you interact, where you control something, and then something that generates the sound as you did this with this one. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. green is starting, so I have this button here. We actually wanted to pass that around. Um, yes. Anyways, Later. so I press this button and then something starts. You know, press the red button and it stops, but it's not in here. It's not this thing that makes the sound. It is the computer. I don't know uh, about your backgrounds, like very basic things. And in between, there is a mapping. So there is something that says, okay, when I press this button, a process starts that renders the sound, actually. And um, so when you when you look at a keyboard, no, when you look at a piano, once again. Um, the way how you play and how you use that stuff is actually determining the sounds in a very natural way. So there's no, not really a way how to change that. I mean, you can change the mechanics, but then it's a different instrument. Or you can prepare a piano as uh, a prepared piano, basically, but then you change the actual instrument. Whereas we are now able here in this electronic environment that we can just introduce a logic and change the way the control plays the sound or controls the sound actually. And so while in the piano the semantics of the controls what you're playing is totally fixed, it is not for this stuff here. For example, uh, let me take this one. You have this. Can I do this? Or yeah, I think does so. it, it might make sound. It might make sound, okay. So we, we have these thumb sticks because you play them actually with your thumb. And a thumb stick has several dimensions, as we say. There is an, an x axis, this one, and a y axis, that one. And you can press it. And that is like a third thing. And I can press while I move the x-axis or while I move the y-axis. And now the easiest way of a mapping is that I have something like a sine oscillator or something like this that where I can put the, let's say, um, play or not on pressing it. So when I press it, it plays something. And when I change the x-axis, it changes the frequency while the y-axis changes the pen between left and right. So, uh, that would be one mapping. So you have a specific semantic of this thing and you have all these uh, dimensions of this thing mapped to something. There's a meaning behind that then. But in a way, these, this thing has a natural semantic, which is like the, they, they always, uh, this thing always snaps back into the middle, into the center. And that it might be nice to, to just use that. So we somehow thought about actually representing this in the device descriptions also, so that you or the computer at some point, we're not that wide, that far for now, but that the computer somehow can make suggestions on how to map things 
together because you might want to have you have a complex instrument like a sound rendering process and in order to play it in a certain way you need a joystick that snaps back and now you're somewhere else and your joystick is broken you just plug in another one and it automatically maps it to something that has a similar semantic that is the idea in a way. Uh, another thing is that you can't really move the x and y axis really independently. Yeah. Uh, like if you move one direction, the other one always will at least move a little bit. Uh, so they're really connected physically, uh, these two axes. And, uh, that's quite important if you want to map it to something, because you can't be very precise in each one individually, but uh, them together may actually provide more interesting information. Uh, with X and Y, you might also want, maybe want to do it in, in like polar coordinates, like the further out you f do the thing, the, the louder it gets, and maybe the, the angle has a meaning. Um, so this is uh, a little bit like... Just to scare you off. Just to scare <laughs> you off. Uh, I use verb at him. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so basically, there's an index with devices that, that are known. Um, so here we have the nano control. Um, it's your, it has some like operating system dependent uh, descriptions uh, for the device name because they show up differently on different OSs. Uh, then what protocol it speaks and a file that it contains the actual description of what that particular device can do. Um, we've also uh, started on making templates, because uh, gamepads will likely have, they might be different brands and, and have slightly different uh, mappings, but they, they mostly have like uh, one or two thumbsticks, uh, these buttons there, the other buttons there, buttons on the, on the shoulders uh, and so on. So it's nice to have like a general description for it, which you can just then just adapt for uh, your particular one. Um, so here we have the HID device. And the Manta is an example of something that you would actually, which is that controller. Uh, which I think speaks some proprietary format over USB. And then there's a little program that translates that to OSC and can send it to, uh, to Super Collider. Um, so this would be the, the index. And then this is for a couple of buttons. Uh, you in indicate what type of control it is. So th uh, this is now in the descriptions of one device, right? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, this one was taken from uh, actually the, the gamepad. So there's two buttons. Um, I didn't show them all. Uh, so you specify the type. Uh, this is, again, some operating system dependent way of how they are enumerated in the, how, this, how the device shows up. The spec is basically a shortcut for um, how they are mapped. Uh, we try to get all controls in a range of between 0 and 1, um, whereas uh, in the operator system they might come in at uh, between 0 and 127 for MIDI, for example. HID it can, can vary depending on the device. Uh, and it's nice to just have them in a standardized range. So, uh, and what you see here is somehow the, the also the semantic description. So, like the type is the button, the end, but from the hardware, from from the interface, the, the hardware interface, there's basically no, basically no difference between, say, a button and a slider. So that this thing just looks the same. But we now specify, okay, this is a button, and we now can, for example, when, when we design an instrument, an actual instrument and a mapping, we can say, okay, we now want all, this, all the buttons and then we select one specific button. So give me all the buttons that you know about this device. 
and something like this. Yeah. Okay. And the actually good thing about this is that you will never see it. <laughs> so we show it to you. You, you basically, if, if you have a device that we have not had yet, then you may have to write one uh, once. But you can just send it to us. And then you send it to us and no one else needs to and, do it. And we, anyway. we write it. No, the device. You, you, if, if you have a device that, that you want to write <laughs> into yes. just, just <laughs> Yes, that too. <laughs> um, so then the second step is like, okay, what to do with the data? Um, that's where the, the mapping comes in. Uh, basically, you can have as many mapping steps in between the thing moving and sound coming out. So this can be endless. And it's totally arbitrary in the sense that you decide how it works. Um, so basically each control can cause a chain of actions uh, and we basically call a unit of actions that uh, basically provide the calculations or the logic uh, to create like new outputs, uh, we call a dispatch. And you can either just write them by hand saying like, well, when this control with that value, I'm going to calculate this and then this is going to be the output. Uh, but there's, of course, a lot of common kinds of things you want to do. Uh, so we created also a bunch of templates. So if, say, well, actually all these buttons, I just want to do something when they go on, when I press them once as a trigger, you can just use the trigger template and you get triggers for all the buttons. Uh, these are the ones we have up to now. Um, uh, so there's trigger. Uh, Page which Miguel will elaborate upon. Uh, yeah, um, maybe I can show them now. What do you think? Are, are um, maybe we show them in detail later. Okay. Not so. Much. Yeah, the trigger, like you said, you press once and it just executes the action, no matter uh, actually if the value is one. Uh, page is like a virtual page system, so. Uh, if your controller uh, is like has motorized faders or has uh, encoders, then you can have virtual scenes that when you go back to a scene, it just repositions all the controls like they were before or in that scene. Uh, threshold, so it makes a trigger when it passes a certain value. Threshold up, uh, the same thing, but only when the, it goes from down to up and the other one. Uh, inverse up, it will only trigger uh, when the values are increasing and gives you the actual value. Down when the values are decreasing. Then the threshold zone, you can set several thresholds, assign an action to each one of these thresholds, and when the controller passes each of these, something gets triggered. Uh, merge can take several uh, controllers or dispatch and merges them into one. Um, and then multi-click is like to have double-click or triple-click kind of actions. Um, what's in there? Uh, what we can use like for IDs? I want to ask because I don't really get it. <laughs> a, a unit of actions that provide the calculations or logic to create new outputs is called the dispatch. Uh, what, what does this mean practically? Should we, should we just show it? Uh, you, you have this thing, yeah. and we have a, a bunch of buttons. And when I press a button, for example, this one is not assigned, uh, I get a zero, no, I get a 127 mm -hmm. when I press it, and I get a zero when I release it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And uh, this is for all that buttons, these buttons, the case. And what now I write an instrument, and I have, for example, here several sounds on this on this uh, array here. And what I want now is to have something where I can just I press the button and then it's on, and I press the button again and then it's off. So it's it's a toggle switch in that way. Or maybe you want to switch through three different states or 25 different states or whatever. And all these this. Like additional complexity is a layer on top 
of the representation of this device, which you can write in a dispatcher. Mm -hmm. So when I press, for example, this button, then it starts to flash. So now it's in a different state. And I can press it again, and now it's back in the original. So that, that's basically the thing. Or I want to remap values from a linear range to an exponential range. Or I want to create frequencies or whatever. Like Everything that you can think of that is somehow a combination also. I can also say, okay, I'll press this button and do like a shift operation on it. Like shift something or something like this. Yeah. Um, so this is a very simple template example for the, the trigger. Um, it basically takes all the sort of elements from a control or another dispatch that you put in there. Um, and basically it sets the value of the output of the dispatch whenever the value of that control is 1. Uh, so normally if you press a button, it, the value is 1. If you release it again, it's, it's 0. So you get two action, two events basically for one times pressing the button and releasing it. Uh, so this one will just give you the value when you press it. Uh, so this is one of the, the simplest, simplest templates, um, and there's, yeah, the page one is, I think, a lot longer to, to deal with everything. Um, and this is actually a simple instrument. Um, we are getting rid of this line of <laughs> code. <laughs> um, so you basically say, uh, well, actually find returns you a whole list of uh, possible instruments. Uh, they say this, uh, this is the one I want. Um, you open it, it will look for the spec for that device. Uh, this is the instrument which I've defined. It's basically just a sine oscillator with three different frequencies. Uh, and I pan it, but I'm not actually changing the panning. Uh, <laughs> then I, t I create a trigger dispatch for all the buttons. And here I just select the, all the buttons. Mm. Uh, so th that's where the semantics comes into play, actually, in the, yeah. in the mapping, in a way. Mm. Um, and I said, well, the green button uh, should be start. And the red button should be stop. And then uh, for the accelerometers, uh, in the simple example, I didn't do any anything fancy. I just said, well, X is going to set frequency 1, Y frequency 2, uh, and Z uh, frequency 3. And I just map the frequency in an exponential way to uh, between those values. Uh, so this already. <coughs> yeah, very simple instruments. I don't know if anyone wants to uh, Just play with it. Yeah, so maybe I would run through a couple of example, examples of this patch and just to get a sense of how it works. Uh, it has a bunch of inputs, which uh, it's up to you to say which inputs it will have. It, then it has a bunch of outputs that it's also up to you to declare them. And then it has a func chain, which is just a list of functions. And whenever something uh, is put in the inputs, 
uh, all these functions are called in the order that they are specified. Um, and then they can update the outputs that they are interested in. And then if you are another, something else is uh, interested in these outputs, it registers with a function such that whenever this output is updated, this function gets called and gets passed uh, the element. Mm -hmm. And that function could just be another dispatch yes. that listens to them. So, a uh, very simple one. Uh, so all the examples are gonna use this uh, nano control. It has uh, eight faders, some knobs, a couple of buttons. Um, on this case, uh, <laughs> it's kind of unstable lately. So we go in. Well, this is the really latest version. This is the leading edge. The bloody edge. Okay. I should make this bigger, I guess. So what I did here is uh, I registered uh, two sliders as inputs of the dispatch, and then I added a function which calculates the average between the two um, sliders and publishes uh, that average as an output called average. And then I'm registering a function which every time the average is updated, uh, it will post that here in the post window. Oh, let me clear this. Yeah. So if both sliders are up, average is one. If one is up, the other is down, average 0 0.5. And so very simple logic. Um, Another thing that you can do is, uh, you, for instance, the sliders, I'm going to say that uh, they're all uh, associated with this name inside in the logic uh, and the buttons with this one. And then I can switch out all my sliders to a different controller by just uh, saying that the sliders are actually now associated with this other nano control that I would have just here, for instance. But I don't. <laughs> uh, so page control is this page system which was working really beautiful yesterday. Today I managed to break it and it doesn't work at the moment. Tomorrow it will work again probably. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've basically been calling anything that makes sounds today. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, Actually yeah. this afternoon. This <laughs> afternoon, yes. So this velocity gives me how fast I'm moving the slider. So if I move it faster, I get bigger numbers. If I move it slower, I get smaller numbers. Uh, yeah, I think I handle it all. So yeah, moving it slowly, moving it fast. It still needs a bit of averaging here. So frequency is connected to speed and modulation to this other. So you've got to work to get it to go faster. So page isn't working today, but if it was, you see here an example <laughs> where first I get a paged version of my controller, so it could have like a bunch of scenes, and then I get the velocity from that controller. So this is kind of like a huge language for controllers in a way that you can compose them 
um, so for instance, in this case, I take all the sliders that are uh, in this controller and I get the velocity and then I get all other elements and I get the um, absolute value and then with merge I combine them into one thing that looks like if it's just one controller. So. So the knobs. Ah. <laughs> The knobs work as usual, absolute value, but now the sliders, I get velocity. And so the actual keys are the same slider two of page one, um, but I've just now changed the logic, although it looks like the same device has the same keys. So that means that this dispatch is actually totally transparent, so you, you don't see, you only see that the functionality changed. Yes, if if you are just using the same controller and you keep using the same keys for outputs that you use for inputs, basically you you don't need to distinguish between the end result and your and the the raw controller that you started with. So then, yeah, figure. Just yeah, I press. When I depress, nothing happens, so just once. Now double click. Uh, threshold. So the threshold is set to yeah, 0 0.5. So just when it crosses the middle. Now, just when it's going up. Down would be the same. So now I set zone. So when it crosses 0 0.2, 0 0.5, or 0 0.8, uh, yeah, we can put a little sound here. So yeah, you see, get the sense. So up, only outputs when the values are increasing. When I go down, nothing happens. Only when values increase. And down, yeah, the opposite. Yeah, and that's uh, what we have so far. But I mean, it's quite easy to, uh, um, yeah define this thing, so I think, yeah, then people can just combine these or write their own to get more functionality. Yeah, that's it on my end. Um. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, maybe a good moment for questions? Yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah? How can we try this? <laughs> um, right now, it's hosted on my uh, private server, um, and I think in the next, actually tomorrow is documentation day, um, so we still need to write documentation because we've been changing so much over the last yeah, days. Yeah, it needs a bit of polishing for sure. And uh, but I think... Yeah, hopefully we'll be able to release it soon, and then it will basically be a quark, uh, okay. the general <coughs> quarks uh, system. Um, the, the Super Collider stable version is currently 3.4, and there are discussions about releasing it the next stable version, which it will be 3.5, and I think since we are relying on some features that are only available in that, uh, we will officially release it around that date, 
Yeah. Or maybe a bit later, but depending on, on how fast we are with publishing. But I, my personal view on this is like uh, publish early and often. So. Yeah. yeah. But did you say that uh, you're willing to, to make a standalone now? Um, no, th there is a. D did we say that? I didn't say that. Uh, well, there's some. <laughs> it's on the website. Yeah, it's on yeah, the website. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, okay. that's, that's true. Um, uh, yeah, I think the the stuff about the standalones. Um, we haven't focused so much on that at the moment. Um, Basically, the idea uh, with modality for that was uh, to also make it easier to make standalones. Because uh, quite a few of, of the people in our group and other people we know, uh, they often write stuff for other people who then go on tour with it. And uh, they just need one program that does what was coded for them uh, and just have that stable version uh, running. Um, so that's actually, in yeah, one of our next residencies, we will also look more into how can we sort of make make it easier to make standalones, uh, grabbing extensions from different places, putting them in the right place. Uh, and there, there are some faults about it. We've talked about it, but it's also not a trivial thing to do. I think the idea with a standalone was basically to provide something that maybe looks or has similar functionality as Junction has. That you yeah, you don't idea. have to be able to program in Super Collider, but you can use your uh, and, or you you learn how you can connect your interfaces, which should be fairly easy after we are finished with this. <laughs> and then you learn not the language, but somehow how you write a synthesis definition. And you just plug that together, mm -hmm. and you have a standalone that is able to provide you a standard interface for that. Yeah. But this is, I would say, more in the future than in the than now or in the near future. So it's, it's yeah. more like like the long-term project to have something like this, because providing something like a standalone for doing exactly this needs polishing and needs a fixed interface and uh, you, you give it to people that are not experienced with that stuff so they will have questions and they will do certainly things that we've never thought of. So it would be good to have mm -hmm. some uh, better face before that. Yeah, I mean, uh, actually after uh, last year's residency in Beck, we did release some of the code we wrote there uh, as a quark. Uh, people started using this, uh, amongst which Miguel, who then wrote some additional stuff for it. So we were like, let's just invite him because he's interested in this stuff and is, is a fairly good programmer. So it would be good to just have him have him there. So we'll first do like user testing by having it available to Superplanner users, uh, and then we can start working more on like. How do we make it accessible for people who don't know Superplider uh, so well? Yeah, this this really seems to be an issue. I mean, from from my practice, I think I always uh, I have a controller, but I always use it for different things between uh, different songs or different mm -hmm. uh, pieces of music, and it's really hard for me to remember or. Uh, Go back to what I was doing, and uh, I think I think to, to retrieve these things or to be able to mm -hmm. uh, use my mapping more cleverly, uh, I would benefit from that. But um, I was I was asking mostly about the standalone program because I was thinking that not everybody is using Super Collider, but I think lots of people would find it very useful to be able to use this with the software that they they use to make music. Mm -hmm. Mm, yeah, I mean, that would mean um, also making, providing the interface to talk with other programs, um, which we're not totally inexperienced with. <laughs> um, 
Well, the the like outputs of a dispatcher, you just could say publish to OSC, and he would just mm -hmm. send everything out to OSC. Yeah. For instance. And I mean, there's there's other things we could look into to yeah. uh, sort of hook into like the McGill University, the Itmill, they've they've made this uh, uh, digital orchestra toolkit mapper thing, where you basically have OSC. Uh, controllers uh, and synthesis processes and you can hook these up and you can do discovery between to see what's what's in the network to what I could talk and just connect to that. Uh, so that would be a f could be a framework that uh, we could hook into. Mm -hmm. There's another one which I actually have been working on over the past years uh, called the Central Data Network which is also an interface to quickly share data between programs like SuperCliber, Pure Data, Mix MSP, uh, Processing, Python, C++. Uh, so actually the, the last one will actually be there quite soon. <laughs> um, yeah. the, I think that the, the difficulty for providing fastly something like a standalone is that we are all involved in many other things and uh, now so now it was really wonderful because we had like eight nine days to actually sit here and code and discuss about how the interfaces will look like and uh, but we are still in a very early stage for that and uh, I'm quite impressed about the state that we have now and I think that I will use it which means since I'm involved in the program I will develop it further but in a way like I, I will focus more on that stuff that I need, actually. And when I have someone who needs something and I, I want to help him or I will get paid to help him or whatever, then something like that will also somehow show up. But it's it's something like th there has to be a need actually for the developers to to work on that, and the, or, or the, that could also be something what we could do in the next meeting in, mm -hmm. in half a year or something, that we just come together again and then work on the particular part, which might be this app standalone thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, sorry, to <laughs> this, is, uh, this is what, what your, my next question was, if you're going to use it in your practice, uh, what possibilities does this open for, for you? I mean, why? You know, what's the benefit in your own musical practice that this system will bring? I mean, what I, what I start to see is that it's kind of the equivalent of uh, like writing synthesis in C++ and then having a UGEN. You know, I don't have to reinvent the wheel every time I, you know, have a sine wave. I write sine OSC. Mm -hmm. And it could be the same thing every time I want velocity or whatever it's quick and I can start thinking on a higher level, or at least, you know, it's not as painful, therefore I will, and of course, uh, I mean, for me actually, uh, uh, I don't know, I, I, I knew that I could do more complex mappings, but the idea of losing too much time with it was not so much fun, so I never did so much of it, but now that it looks quite easy, I think I will just do more because, you know, and for sure, the results will be interesting, I think. For me, the, the most mad? Yeah, I wanted to show to Paul that. Uh, so I compiled the library, no hands. Yeah. And to get my controller working, it's one line. <laughs> <laughs> when it doesn't crash. <laughs> Yeah, to be fair, we should say that this is not exactly our fault. fault. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we can't really fix it. But that, that's it, and now you have the controller. Yeah, it's working. And this is like before that, and, and it, it is independent from if you use MIDI or HID at the moment. Mm -hmm. And it will be independent from if you use MIDI, HID, or OSC, or the Wii mode or something like yeah, this. Basically. You just write that line and change actually, that name. Actually, you can leave away the MIDI. And yeah, then you have to do the fine. Yeah, oh, then it's still two lines. Well, the idea is that eventually this will become this, and you just run this line. And it feel, 
So basically, it's detecting all the devices that are there. It's giving an automatic name. And I know that the automatic name that it gives to the nano control, which there's only one of it in my system, is this one. Therefore, I just type it, and I get the control. So I mean, for those using Super Collider, it was a couple more lines than this uh, before. So. And there's only one of it. Every time I call this again, I will get just the same instance. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's. But, but this is because the nano control is on the template. Yeah. It's not yeah, but, but the plan is that we. So, I mean, if you want to need, use one of these devices which is not in the templates, uh -huh. you have someone, one person has to write a template for it. It will look exactly the same, more or less, for everyone because it's the device that does that, and then you send it to me, or to, to us, or we write it, or whatever, and then it will be available, and that's it. So the, the, the plan is actually that there are like, I don't know, a thousand devices on the market, and it takes like two months, and then you have all the templates together. Yeah, and the, the sending part is assuming I'm not a developer. If I'm not a developer, I can see another template and probably yeah, it's for, or you, you Google and you find a template, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> and you put it and into your, your library yeah, and then and you have actually it. Actually, for things like HID devices, uh, you know the device reports what controls it has. Oh. Uh, so it's quite easy to just make uh, a template for that. Yeah. And then you just have to fill in the details, like saying, like, okay, I do this, it move, I get this value. Uh, yeah. Yeah, like, well, I've used I KTL before, and I've tried to do some, it's kind of similar, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. KTL was the, our, uh, basically, actually the KTL naming comes from MIDI KTL, JIT MIDI KTL, from Alberto, uh, which we then, in the first residency, tried to abstract to KTL to deal with several devices. Yeah. And now we wrote now it completely we, new. And now we decided to rewrite it and, and call it MKTL, which is kind of referencing to Jeff's M. He was using uh, classes called M keys, so we took the M. And the M is for modality, I think. Uh, yeah. Or mighty. Or yeah. Nifty. <laughs> My keys. M keys. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah. So we. It's it's like a progression. Okay, Mr. Farmer, you always have to write the instrument by yourself, or then you also steer other like already existing synthesizers. Uh, you could just send out MIDI again to other to other machines, or okay, good. yeah. No. Yeah. So we, we didn't concentrate on on writing a library of synth steps, but there are currently. Efforts, at least on the mailing list of people that want to somehow have something like a free sound library, but you don't have the sounds, but this synth def definitions there, or something like this, or like if you don't, if you know processing, for example, there, uh, it's a programming language for visual stuff, and there is a, a huge community behind it that has a web page where you have the processing patches, and you can just copy paste that stuff, for example, and just work from there on. Yeah. But that's not, not well, what we, we did here. We did discuss writing a general MIDI class. <laughs> a general MIDI class, yeah. <laughs> Which should be fairly easy. There were only a few oscillators involved. Anyhow, yeah. so. We could do that every time. <laughs> <Any time. laughs> you mentioned something about the computer doing your suggestions. Yeah. Uh, for now, this is just like, as you saw that briefly in one example, you can just collect all buttons mm -hmm. or something like this. But uh, actually, this, this is somehow rounding work what we did. And this provides us with the possibility to actually build upon that with machine learning technology, for example, to, to include something where you have that semantic level in there or that semantic layer in there. And uh, yeah, but. It is at an early stage. So. Yeah. <coughs> mm -hmm. I don't know. Should we have a short break? Um, 
Because we, we did want to improvise a little with the instruments we wrote. Or are there more questions still?
A serious. Hmm? Serious. So yeah. I mean, changing the, the sound.